Okay, so our next session is on water intelligence. So if I could move to our first speaker, who's Tim Rooney, CEO of Waterfind Holdings, which is our leading water market specialist and brokerage company. Tom grew up in uh, Riverland on an irrigated citrus uh, property, and Waterfind uh, is private, employing more than 40 staff, expanded its operations into California, and if it was a public company, I'd be buying shares. Uh, and here he is to provide an overview. Thank you. Thanks, Tiki. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, nice to see so many friends and colleagues here. The, uh, uh, my job here is to not to go deep into the Australian water markets, uh, although I'd love to do that, but there's plenty of speakers that can be doing that today. So I'm, I'm here setting a bit of a global context of where water's going. So in relation to this global context, uh, I'll be talking about the global water challenge, uh, which is emerging, uh, embedded water, and what's happening with water markets globally. And then other speakers will drill into the specifics of the Australian water market and how it applies to the wine industry. So my job's setting the foundation. So globally, uh, planet water, not planet Earth, 70% of the globe is covered with water. And however, 2.5% of the, uh, the water available on the Earth is fresh water. It's over 40,000 cubic kilometres uh, of water is fresh water. Out of that uh, 40,000 cubic, cubic kilometres, uh, around 68% of it, or nearly 70% of it, is actually locked in our glaciers and ice caps. So not very, uh, not very useful to grow wine grapes unless you are looking at ice wine in, uh, in uh, the Arctic. But certainly the majority of that's locked in our ice caps and glaciers. Uh, about 30% of it's locked in our groundwater, and a mere 1.2% of it is sitting in our rivers, dams, in our hydrological system, which uh, goes and refreshes. So, out of uh, out of our 40 odd thousand cubic kilometres, we use about 9% of that total uh, freshwater renewable surface and groundwater supplies. Um, so on, the, on the, the, the broad scheme of it, it looks like that we've got plenty to go. We've got 91% of water availability left, but a lot of that water that is left, you've got to remember, is locked in ice caps and or unaccessible groundwater or is, uh, is situated away from our major food bowls and cities. Uh, in Australia, the wine grape industry uses about 7% of the total water applied to Australian farms, and irrigation uses about 70% of uh, globally of water. However, uh, I believe it's unfair. This, uh, these numbers vary from country to country, but it is unfair to single out our industry um, because we've got to remember that human beings use 100% of our agricultural output. And uh, so this is, brings me to uh, the concept of embedded water. Certainly, if we listen to the, uh, uh, our major, well, some of the major policy makers will suggest that in Adelaide here, uh, a human being will use about 130 litres of water per day. Uh, but the real use of water is very different to that because you're sitting on water you're wearing water, you ate water for lunch. The wine that you have uh, today uh, after this, uh, about 109 litres of water per glass to produce. The, so we are water beings and we consume water in the produce that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the houses that we live in, the cars that we drive, the mobile phones that we use. This all takes water to produce. The real number of water consumption when you take into account embedded water, which is classified as that water which is required to produce the goods and services that we consume, is more uh, in the lines of 8,500 litres of water today, per day, per person, 
or greater than that. Certainly the embedded water, and unfortunately this is a very small chart, uh, but I'm happy to provide this to you afterwards. I did see on your, uh, on your desk there, uh, you've got uh, a smaller chart of this again. But what this does, is it, it does uh, outline from a Western country what the water consumption is, from an African country what the water consumption is per day, and from an Asian country what a, uh, water consumption is. And certainly that will outline that in Western countries we have a very water-heavy diet. So and that's uh, from a number of different regions, uh, reasons because uh, uh, high protein diets, uh, the, uh, the, we live the good life. Uh, the, uh, certainly African and Asian countries have a, a lower consumption of water. With an additional two and a half billion people coming on our planet uh, in the next 35 years or 34 years, uh, in water terms, we look at these people very differently. So two and a half billion people on the planet will consume an additional, uh, that's if they have born in Western societies and or some of the developing countries growing middle classes, they will consume an additional 11 trillion million litres of water per year. So that's a lot of zeros, 11 trillion million litres. I don't know if it's a zillion or a gazillion or something like this, it's a big number. And so where are we going to get this water from? Who's going to feed our two and a half billion population? And we believe that the global pressures for water uh, demand and supply, which are already emerged in a lot of our major food bowls, is likely to rise sharply over the next 30 years. And we believe water markets will play a key role in this. This is a, a different way of looking at planet water. Uh, so what that will look like here is this is using a Dymaxion map uh, it's a Californian engineer uh, developed this, and it's it's the only what's 99.9% .9 accurate as far as the land mass is concerned. And what we can see there is globally that our land mass is one island in a big ocean, and the OECD does project that by 2050, 40% of our global population will be living in basins that are suffering from severe water stress. I'll just say that number again. 40% of our global population will be living in countries that are suffering from severe water stress. That's 3.9 billion people that will be sitting in populations that are suffering from severe water stress. So it's, it's not surprising that the World Economic Forums, et cetera, have now risen water as one of the top 10 uh, items. In fact, I think two years ago it was number one in the top 10 issues that we need to urgently address through the world. And uh, we believe that appropriate water sharing, uh, appropriate incentives and trigger points to encourage the more efficient use and uh, a debate around what we're going to do about sharing our water resources is going to be critical in the future. Water markets, as I said, will uh, pay, play a key part of this because markets are certainly the most efficient way of distributing any uh, scarce goods or service. And Australia is not the first in the world to invent water markets. In fact, water markets were first invented in Valencia, Spain in the 1500s. So almost uh, 500 or more years, this water court, which still operates today uh, and would be a great place to go and visit, I must visit it one day, uh, is a place where water holders and two major channels uh, get together and sort out disputes and transfer irrigation slips. And that's happened for the last 500 plus years at a water court every Friday in Valencia, Spain. So globally, uh, however, Australia does have the most mature water market mechanism and the Productivity Commission has done several reports on this about the hundreds of billions of dollars of additional economic activity that's being created as a result of this. Globally, uh, this could be hundreds of billions of dollars. So as I said, uh, and three times, the uh, markets will be critical to the future management of water resources. 
Globally, water markets are in various stages of development. Uh, in Australia, we have electronic markets which uh, have emerged over the last 15, 20 years. There are some areas in China that have, have uh, immature markets, but they are effective. They do uh, water, uh, water slip transfers, and those water slips are also used to buy uh, the local mill down the, that can be transferred for other goods and services. Uh, in California, which we've been doing a lot of our most recent work in, there are water markets there, but they are, it's death by attorney. Uh, there's uh, uh, currently costs about 20 or 30 per cent per transaction to do, a, to do a water transaction in California. So there's very steps of development. And what's true with all of these markets, and Australian included, is that there's much more work needed to increase the efficiencies of the market, reduce the transaction costs, and to bring the full benefits that markets can offer to the irrigation sectors and our wine community. So in closing, um, Waterfine builds and operates water markets in Australia and overseas. Uh, this gives us a very unique view of what's occurring in the water sector overseas. We're very excited uh, about the future that Australian agriculture particularly has on the global stage. And I know we we, uh, we can be quite critical sometimes about our own water management structures, but globally they are revered as being one of the best in the world. And many countries are now looking at Australia to, to repeat the, the advantages which they're seeing, because I can tell you some of the countries where you have a command and control system in water, how would you like a government to tell you that you can't get any water this year and you, can't, you have to switch you have to switch off altogether. There's no mechanism to bring that water back. So um, we're doing a report at the moment uh, on uh, called the rise of global water markets. Uh, with our author is sitting here, Ben. If you can, uh, I just raise your hand. So uh, Ben's some botanist from Peru, but uh, he's uh, he's an Australian and he's also doing a, a really interesting report. If you did want to get a copy of that report, which we're hoping is going to be available in the next eight to 10 weeks, um, please see Ben and, and put your name down for it. So I hope this uh, has been a good broad overview. As I said, my, my job here has been to set the stage, the big stage of where water's looking at globally. And I look forward to the rest of the speakers and particularly my, my colleague, Alastair Walsh uh, and other members of the panel and their discussions in water to go a little deeper, how it relates in the, in the Australian sector and in particular the wine sector. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. I always find those global statistics really horrifying, but as you say, we're in the right place. Uh, and now we're going to hone down a little more into the southern uh, Murray-Darling Basin. Will Fargo is, a co co is the co-founder of uh, Aether Consulting, uh, which is all about economic analysis and strategy development. Before Aether, he was general manager at the National Water Commission, may it rest in peace. Uh, and I've had a look at your uh, brilliant report. And uh, look, I just wish I'd, I'd had, had access to it about 15 years ago, uh, but uh, I look forward to hearing about it now. Thanks, Will. Thank you, uh, Tiki. Thank you uh, to, the, to the summit organisers for providing me with the opportunity to, to speak with you this afternoon. Um, as per the introduction, uh, my name is Will Farger. I'm the director of Aether. Uh, just very quickly, who, uh, who is that? Who are we? Um, we're a specialist water advisory practice uh, operating predominantly in the, in the Murray-Darling Basin. I'm based in Canberra uh, and we have an office uh, in, in Melbourne and in Brisbane. Uh, we do work for governments in policy uh, and, and program advisory and review spaces in relation to water policy, water markets and water infrastructure. And we also do work for commercial businesses on commercial strategy and due diligence with respect to water, water entitlements and water infrastructure. Um, we're completely independent. We have no position in the water market. Uh, and we base our advice heavily on analysis of the available data. Uh, and so 
The purpose of this presentation is just to run you through some of what we're observing with respect to uh, the market, um, provide an overview of market uh, formation and, and structure, prices, trends and drivers, and some of the implications for the, for the wine grape industry, particularly with a focus on the Southern Murray-Darling Basin. This is the connected trading zones of the Southern Murray-Darling Basin uh, across southern New South Wales, northern Victoria and the SA Murray. That'll be familiar to many of you. And as we know, there are linkages out of those trading zones now through infrastructure into other areas such as, as the Barossa. Why do we focus on the Southern Murray-Darling Basin? Because that's where 90 per cent of water market activity occurs nationally. Uh, we're talking about a market with a total entitlement value, the right held in perpetuity, of between six to seven billion dollars, uh, an annual turnover in 2014-15 uh, of about 400 million in both entitlement, the right in perpetuity, and allocation, so the annual water available for use. So it's a pretty significant market. There are smaller, uh, less well-developed markets in other areas uh, of the country, but the lion's share occurs in the Southern Murray-Darling Basin, and that's where I'll focus for the rest of this discussion. Quick look at uh, market prices over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. This is the all allocation prices recorded uh, in the New South Wales, Victorian and South Australian state, state registers uh, from July 07 through to April 16. And so you can see through that scatter plot, and it really is a scatter plot in those earlier years, uh, some clear trends before any kind of data analysis, uh, particularly uh, some very high prices during the worst of the millennium drought, uh, significant depression in prices as the drought broke and we had some very wet years, and a return uh, of higher prices as we've returned to drying conditions. When we look at entitlement prices, and these are high security entitlements, which are probably the most relevant for people in this room, over a similar period, uh, we see a concentration of the trend in the latter years and a distinct uptick. Some of that will be associated with an improvement in price discovery over that period. Uh, and so while prices uh, in the early part or left-hand side of that chart look extremely scattered, uh, part of that is because price recording and registers have matured over that period as well. Um, and so there's an overlay there. But you again see some clear trends without any kind of analysis. Um, let's have a look at, at some of the analysis that we've done. And, and Tiki was gracious in, in um, giving us a plug for the report that we've recently done for the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation, which is a research report looking at contemporary drivers. Uh, on the demand side of irrigation in the Southern Murray-Darling Basin. We did a companion report that we also released this year for the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources at the Commonwealth level, which looks at supply side drivers of water allocation prices in the Southern Murray-Darling Basin. I'll just touch briefly now on some of the key results from those two reports. Starting on the supply side, as Many of you will know intuitively as water conditions worsen, as we see a drying uh, or reduction in water availability, prices go up. It's interesting the number of people, particularly in government, uh, to whom this comes as a surprise. Uh, but clearly we can see there with that black line uh, through 2006, 7 through to 8, 9, in the middle of the chart, some very high prices when water allocations were low. So the bars there are total water allocation. Then as water allocation in more recent years uh, increased, uh, as the drought broke, we saw a significant decrease in price. Uh, and as allocations have dropped off again, the price starts to go up. So clearly there's a very strong relationship here between water availability and price. Um, the black line there is the actual price. The dashed yellow line is our model price. And so we've built over the course of a number of years a uh, water allocation price model um, that is a predictive model based on a number of um, inputs that looks at allocation prices under different scenarios. And that's our, um, the results of, of our modelling against actuals. So you can see it's not perfect, uh, but it's pretty close and certainly good enough to get a sense of some of these macro trends. The green parts of the bars that you see in the latter year 
are the amount of allocation in each year that is now going to the environment by way of allocations to entitlements that are held by the Commonwealth. So entitlements that were covered through buyback and are held by the Commonwealth, that's the portion of allocation that's going to those uh, entitlements. There's a question uh, in the current policy debate with respect to the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan about the impact of those water recovery efforts on price. This is it. What you can see there is the modelled price with the Commonwealth purchases and without. With the Commonwealth purchases included in the model run, you see the orange line that's slightly higher than the yellow line. That order of magnitude suggests that about 25 per cent of the increase in allocation price from 2011 to 2014-15 can be attributed over those years to water recovered for the environment. So it's significant, but it's certainly not the primary driver of price. By far and away, the primary driver of price is seasonal water availability as a result of climate. Let's have a look at the demand side quickly as we keep moving. Uh, big swing factors there in water use uh, over time through 2005-06 to 2013. The black line there is dairy. Uh, the next most dramatic change is rice. Pretty predictable, interruptible uh, annual production systems. Um, what's interesting then is to have a look at cotton, which is the light blue line that appears at the bottom of the chart. Fairly sustained growth through the southern Murray-Darling Basin. Higher value user than cotton, uh, than dairy or rice. Also interesting to note the uptick there in the olive line with regard to fruit and nuts. A lot of that's high value nuts, almond, significant uptick. And wine grapes there, or grapes as whole, so that will be um, through the ABS data, wine and table grapes, fairly steady in that orange line through that period. We have forecast the increase in demand uh, over the next five years with respect to the change in water availability. Uh, sorry, in terms of the change in demand, its impact on water availability and price. The most significant change that we're going to see in the Murray-Darling Basin with regards to structural change in water consumption over the next five years will occur from high value nuts, particularly almonds. Uh, and what we're seeing as a result of that, and also the continued expansion of cotton through the southern MDB, is in low seasons an increase in price that can be attributed to that demand side change only of about 10% in allocation prices. In moderate and low allocation, uh, higher allocation years, that falls to about 7 and 5 per cent, respectively. So we can see the increase in prices, prices that are tracking uh, from a number of supply side factors and a number of demand side factors. Uh, and we can start to get a better sense of what they look like in isolation. Clearly, the most interesting question is what happens when they come together? What's the price impact in aggregate of those demand and supply side changes under different seasonal water availability scenarios as you look forward. And particularly, those impacts are going to be most accentuated in those extreme dry years. So the impact of environment, nuts, urban users, uh, and we know that urban water utilities now hold significant amounts of entitlement that they generally sell back into the market in most high water availability and medium water availability years, they hold on to in extreme dry years. And so that water comes out of the pool as well. So that points to some significant price increases, uh, well above those kind of percentage increases that we've talked about in isolation. Um, and that's when we can start to foresee uh, prices that start to have implications even for the higher value users. We haven't published on that um, yet. It's the subject of some current work, so I won't foreshadow that, but it's a clear issue for consideration if, as a result of climate change, we think there's going to be a higher number of those extremely dry events. So let's look at some of the adjustment pressure and the questions around viability that occurs uh, and we would argue will continue to occur. You've seen this price chart that shows the dispersion of allocation prices over that time period. What's that um, overlaid with there in the, in the lines is the water recovered uh, by the environment. So they're the Commonwealth water purchases registered through that period. Uh, and what we can see in terms of the pattern of behaviour over that time was that in the period of kind of 07 through to 2010, significantly affected, drought affected debt levels um, through many entitlement holders in the southern Murray-Darling Basin, 
allocation prices were high. The Commonwealth stepped into the market and started buying significant amounts of entitlement, as is shown there. And so many irrigators sold entitlement at that time. Now, that would be a good time to consider adjustment decisions, having received the capital for, uh, to facilitate that adjustment. But by then, allocation prices have dropped to $20 or $40 a meg. So you've sold entitlement, you've got a good cash return, allocations are cheap, well, why don't I just stay in the market for allocations? And I can continue to do what I'll do uh, with allocations rather than entitlement. And that's a viable strategy when allocations are 20 or 40 bucks a meg. But then in more recent years, we've seen allocations back up over the 200 up to the $300 a meg mark. That is unviable for many irrigators who now rely on that. Uh, and overlay that, particularly in Northern Victoria, with the collapse of the dairy milk price. More adjustment, significantly more adjustment will occur in Northern Victoria as a result of this relationship. Uh, that has implications for other water users in the basin. What are we going to see? We're going to see continued changes in changes uh, in entitlement ownership. Not sure if this work's been done in South Australia, it's been done in Victoria, which shows the change in entitlement ownership over time. Clearly, we're seeing a move away from some of the large established irrigation areas into different forms of ownership, either as private diverters, water corporations for urban water supply, and to the environment. Last slide. As a result of these trends and drivers, water markets are going to become increasingly important as a tool for managing flexibility, individual decision-making and adjustment over time. Encouragingly, over the period, we have seen significant maturation in the market as a mechanism and of individuals' participation in the market as people learn how to use it. The clearest example of that, when you look at the price dispersion chart, is to have a look at the early season price response to low water availability announcements. And so the blue chart, uh, part of the chart there, is the water availability or water allocation announcements as they step up over the years. You can see in those extreme dry years, when we start seasons at low water availability, there's a significant price spike in the early part of the chart on the left-hand side. Uh, now, when we come back into similarly dry conditions on the right-hand side of the chart, we no longer see that early season price shock um, because people now have a better understanding of the way that allocation decisions are made uh, and a better understanding of their ability to use the market to make up shortfall. Uh, and so that is encouraging. The big question is there in the very lightly shaded section of uh, the chart on the far right hand side, what does that look like next year? Uh, and um, I'm sure someone else is going to answer that question. So thank you for your time and uh, look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Will. Well, yes, we're getting towards answering that question. Um, the, the next speaker uh, is going to be talking all about water allocations. Tim Goods is Tim is the Deputy Chief Executive of the Department of the Environment, Water and Natural Resources. He's responsible for policy and strategy development and is the Basin Official for South Australia. And he's going to be talking about the dark art of determining allocations for South Australian irrigators. Thanks, Tiki. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. So, uh, the government, of course, is, is the uh, regulator uh, of water resources in South Australia, the operator of the, the River Murray system, and the department is the uh, policy advisor to, um, to the minister uh, that does the science and the policy to inform the advice. Um, I guess focusing, drilling down, following the theme from global to the very specific in the here and now, um, everyone would know the story. It's, it's been pretty dry, so uh, there's a couple of um, snapshots from the, the Bureau of Met and really just focusing on the uh, chart on the, or the picture on the right, um, which shows the um, rainfall across the basin to the end of April, uh, and you can see that uh, it's very dry. 
um, or much drier than average around the from the 60th down to the 20th, even to the 10th percentile of of the mean or the average rainfall. Uh, interestingly, uh, yesterday we got one to the end of May, and there's uh, lots more green on there. So it has been uh, has been a wet May, and if you take the 12 months to May. Uh, in the northern part of the basin, it has been um, above average, still just a tad below average in the southern basin, which is really um, where we, of course, get a lot of our storage from. So uh, the, it doesn't um, take a rocket scientist, therefore, to know that um, this chart is the state of uh, combined storages uh, across the basin, which, of course, is one of the key determinants of um, our capacity to allocate uh, water each year. And um, you, you can see the, the dark, the thick, the, the wavy blue line that's a constant is uh, seasonal average. Um, and uh, you can see the, the thick line demonstrating through the period of drought, uh, the very low levels of storage all up. Uh, and you can see right at the moment that we are sitting at about 25% uh, capacity uh, or stored storage capacity filled. Uh, co uh, combined across the basin. So we're not uh, starting from a uh, strong base. I guess the unique position for South Australia in that is that for the first time we have uh, volumes of entitlement flow which we have deferred and stored. So uh, we have priority access to some of that um, water. Uh, just quickly in terms of where we are heading for uh, season 16-17, the government has announced uh, a minimum opening allocation in the, the River Murray prescribed water course of 36 per cent, uh, and we'll uh, update that regularly through the season uh, as, as time goes. Um, we've, um, there are three, I guess, climate scenarios that uh, we've presented here to demonstrate where, where we uh, think we, allocations will head under each of those scenarios. Uh, the very dry scenario, so the 95th um, annual exceedance probability, which means that uh, only in five years out of 100 would we expect drier conditions. Uh, under that scenario, if it plays out, uh, we would have entitlement flow of 1,310 gigalitres. <coughs> excuse me, and that would mean that by the end of the season, the end of the year. Um, license holders would have 65 per cent uh, of allocation. Uh, if we move to a moderate climate scenario, so we're only 25 uh, per cent of years uh, are, are drier, uh, we would have 1,560 gigs of inflow, and that's the point at which irrigators would have 100 per cent of inflow, and every improvement after that obviously remains at 100 per cent. Um, so how, how will we make decisions about uh, when the allocations move? So uh, there's a, a reasonably uh, conservative um, opening allocation um, minimum being announced, and that'll be uh, confirmed or adjusted uh, by the 1st of July. And any improvements after that will be based on actual water resource availability improvements. And so that will be more rain, more water in storages, uh, more water on allocation. Uh, and that, that, of course, is uh, monitored by the, uh, by the MDBA, by the states, and, um, on, and uh, reported through. Uh, and, and we will um, announce that regularly until we get to the point of 100 per cent. So people obviously wanting to know what's going on in the storages uh, in between those announcements. And uh, there's a website there that uh, probably many are aware of and, and follow uh, on the Murray-Darling Basin Authority site. And that's just a screenshot of it, so it, um, you hover over the point that you want. So at um, 10.30 on the 2nd of June, Lake Victoria was 46 per cent full and, and uh, other sorts of bits and pieces of information are available there. Um, and also the state government has uh, similar data uh, on its site using uh, additional monitoring points. The, uh, the other piece of policy change this year is, for, uh, is the availability of private carryover into the next um, the next water year. So uh, on top of the minimum opening allocation, uh, and people who underuse in the current year will be able to uh, access that uh, in the next water year. And there's been quite 
a bit of information available about that. Uh, and there are several sort of policy parameters there. So up to 20% of entitlement is uh, as long as it's un unused in the previous year, so the current year, is available in the next year. And that will be determined automatically once um, meter readings have been uh, provided. And those meter readings are required by the 31st of July. Uh, I guess the, uh, we too have a, a report, like the previous speakers. Uh, ours is called the Basin Plan. That we are, and I guess the, uh, the current dry conditions really reiterate uh, the need for the Basin Plan to be delivered on time and in full. Uh, there's um, quite some work still to be done. Uh, a significant proportion of the water recovery uh, that is required uh, is underway. Um, and uh, we would expect that once our sustainable diversion limit is adjusted, um, with, the, uh, with the projects that are currently underway, that South Australia's uh, gap bridging effort is, is pretty much done. But there will be other opportunities for um, uh, water efficiency infrastructure projects and, and the like, of which there have been uh, several hundred million of dollars of investment thus far. Um, but there are a number of targets that we're in the plan that the plan seeks to achieve to ensure a healthy working river, uh, particularly at the bottom end of the system around uh, salinity levels, uh, mouth opening uh, and lake levels and so on, that uh, we still have some work to do to, to get to a point of, um, of delivering on those, those plan outcomes. So I guess in a, in a quick overview, that's a snapshot of the, um, the, the River Murray for 16-17. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Dark art, as you can see. Uh, and uh, our next speaker is Alistair Walsh, uh, moving to water trading now, uh, supply, demand and, and pricing. Alistair is CEO of Waterfind Australia, which covers the, 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 obviously the big trading operations. Uh, as you can see, he's a rower of Sam Standing and he clearly loves the river. Thank you, uh, Tiki, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, what I'm going to try and do is really just put it in context around where, uh, where allocations, um, obviously where allocations are looking. Um, Tim's obviously given us an understanding of where they're looking uh, under the current conditions for South Australia. But more and more importantly, it's about um, we, we operate in a, a connected market, and so it's not just um, what South Australian irrigators are going to have and potentially what surpluses uh, should uh, uh, irrigators need extra water uh, and, and how that relates in South Australia. It's about how that relates uh, to irrigators interstate and the connection and availability of, of surplus water uh, to support uh, that demand. So as we've seen, um, the conditions as they currently are, the, the catchment is, is, is fairly dry. Um, we've drawn down our, uh, our reserves in the Murray, Murray system. The Murray system is, um, has a capability to smooth out um, to a certain level those low inflows. So it gives us a capability for a couple of years to deal um, as, a high, as a high entitlement holder, high security, security uh, delivery. Uh, it gives uh, the natural resource managers a capability to um, support those um, in, in a period of, of lower inflow for a period of time. And we've basically had 18 months now of, of, of low inflows and are now starting to feel the, uh, the pinch. Uh, in South Australia, um, a reduced opening allocation with a, with a view of hopefully um, moving uh, to, uh, to higher uh, allocations. Um, in, uh, in New South Wales and Victoria, and we'll go through some of the, some of the allocation announcements, um, lower, um, low or no uh, uh, allocation, opening allocation uh, for uh, lower tier uh, priority holders uh, and, and potentially some scale back openings uh, also uh, for those, um, for those uh, um, medium or, or high security priority holders in, in, in New South Wales and Victoria. So the recent rains that we've had through May have been uh, have been a, a start, um, but to put things in context around uh, really the inflows that we've had in this in this year, and uh, and in line with I suppose what we've seen um, in years gone by, 
Um, obviously, out of the millennial drought, we saw though that, that significant reversal uh, and, uh, and, a, and a significant resetting of the, uh, of, of the system. Um, delivered a number of good years, and we've really um, drawn on those uh, those um, volumes, those water, that water that was um, uh, brought into the system over that period. Um, but we have seen these declining inflows uh, over the last uh, last three years. In the last year, so the the, the uh, 15-16 water year that we've, we're just coming out of now and starting to head into uh, to the 16-17 uh, year, um, it has been. Uh, one of the driest um, that we've we've had. So uh, I think there are there are only a number of those years through the millennial drought which have been um, drier as far as um, uh, uh, or in the same league as far as sort of inflow periods. So we've, we're certainly um, just reiterating that uh, lower base uh, that we're we're starting off. But we have seen um, you know, certainly a peak in inflows in the beginning of May with those early rains or those rains, and uh, certainly in the last. Uh, and you can see this has just come off the uh, Murray-Darling Basin uh, weekly report this, this afternoon, and you can see the impact um, on uh, inflows into the, uh, into the Murray system uh, in the last, uh, um, last few or last week or so. So a system resetting event really is required to get us back to a, to a bit of an even queue, um, and, and um, you know, certainly for those irrigators uh, on lower tier, tier entitlements, uh, for them to get to back to some um, sort of significant level of, of allocation, um, we obviously we're not getting a lot of support uh, from uh, the northern uh, part of the, the basin at the moment, um, with um, you know, significantly low levels of flow uh, getting through to uh, to the Menindee Lakes, and so there's no uh, certainly a, a a need for um, you know. A, a significant cyclone event or some sort of um, you know, significant re um, uh, return of, um, of uh, um, conditions uh, in the north, really to get any, uh, uh, any benefit um, and support our, our catchments down here. We're reliant, therefore, on what we're able to capture and store uh, in that southern, southern system. And as I said, um, you know that needs to be um, you know looking at those uh, those current inflows. We need to see that that uh, inflow line continue at or above that longer term trend to really start to, to see some some um, change to our cir current circumstance. The expectation um, next year um, uh, is that um, with those um, with those lower certainly those lower beginning uh, uh, allocations that. Um, trade will be um, heavily reliant on. It already is being heavily reliant on as irrigators are preparing uh, for, for potentially a dry year. And we certainly, um, I think, have had the benefit um, in the last couple of seasons of earlier and earlier forecast announcements so that the departments, uh, the natural resource managers, providing guidance um, ahead, um, well ahead in this, in this case, in February uh, of um, some probabilities around uh, you know, the current state of, the state of those resources uh, and the, the likely impact of a continuation of the, uh, uh, of the current conditions. And what that's enabled irrigators to do, along with uh, tools such as carryover capability, uh, access to forward markets, um, it's enabled them to, to prepare uh, and better risk manage uh, potentially shortfall, shortfalls in some of those allocations uh, into the new year. Um, so the expectation, um, as we have seen this year, for those of you that are in the in the Murray system, um, will be um, you know, significant impact um, of supply and de and demand to a certain extent, of um, uh, with the, the trading limitations that are, uh, are uh, inherent in the system, um, the, the the trade into or out of the Murrumbidgee, um, the trade into and out of the Goulburn system, and and the potential um, at some stage for a um, a, uh, an impact of, of trade from above or uh, to below the, uh, um, the Barma choke and, and, and certainly the impact of, of that uh, um, uh, closure um, would be you know, reasonably significant with you know, certainly significant levels, um, over 70 per cent of New South Wales uh, as entitlement sitting above that, uh, that, that choke, peer, choke area at, um, above uh, Echuca. Um, and also about 30% of, of Victorians' um, Murray entitlements. So the impact of losing 
for an irrigator in South Australia or in the lower part of the, the system of losing access to that water, that potential surplus water that may be available there, um, you know, can have quite a significant impact on, um, on supply um, and particularly uh, through, the, through the summer peak uh, delivery period or use period. Um, Tim's provided a, a, an overview of South Australia. Um, a minimum opening announcement uh, of 36 per cent. So hopefully with the conditions that have that changed, maybe that will be slightly higher, but certainly that's the, the lowest you can expect it to go. We're certainly seeing irrigators taking um, significant advantage of the carryover capability. Uh, now, be it uh, uh, retaining unused water that they haven't used this year and not selling it, as, as traditionally they may have done at this time of year, or alternatively going into the market and securing more water uh, to, uh, to top up uh, their, um, their, their allocation holding and, and being able to take that uh, up to that 20 per cent uh, across to, uh, to next year. Um, conditions in South Australia, um, I think the probabilities of, um, uh, of, um, of full allocation is, is pretty good, certainly in comparison to what we're seeing um, in, in some other systems. Here's the Goulburn. Um, as of uh, mid-May, when the, the most recent forecast was, uh, was out, um, the Goulburn system was tracking somewhere um, just above the extreme dry scenario, so certainly at the dry, at uh, the Goulburn and, and the Murray as well in Victoria. And so the, without significant uh, change in those systems, um, you know, potentially there's, uh, um, you know, there's, a, there's a possibility of lower than, um, you know, than slight, slightly lower in the Goulburn system than 50%. Um, hopefully they move back into a more average situation. We do see uh, higher allocations there. Um, in the Murray system, um, similar uh, sort of levels should we, should we maintain at this current dry um, scenario, but certainly we've started to see improvements uh, obviously through May in those inflows and we will get a forecast, uh, an updated forecast on the 1st of July for both um, systems in Victoria. In the New South Wales Murray, um, we've seen restriction on or opening restriction on high security entitlement holders. Um, somewhere between 75 to 90 per cent, but the expectation is you will get your full uh, 97 per cent uh, um, over, over the period of the first, first couple of months. Um, at, as you can see, under very dry and even dry scenarios, um, general security entitlement holders are looking at um, getting very little allocation, and, um, and certainly uh, the Murray is faring um, much worse than the, uh, than the Murrumbidgee, where they've already seen quite strong uh, inflows and uh, conditions are looking um, pretty solid. Um, allocations for general security entitlement holders in line to a certain extent with what they received um, this year. The impact of both the general security allocation in the Murray and the uh, Murrumbidgee uh, is really the, the, the last la loss of that baseline allocation availability. So um, we've had higher temporary prices uh, in this water year without um, significant inflows or significant um, uh, um, allocations to those two entitlement types um, being a, a, you know, a large proportion. New South Wales has very, a small ratio of, of high security entitlements to general security entitlements, so therefore they can support their, high, um, their permanent plantings and their high security uh, users, but they have a much larger um, uh, level of general security entitlement holders, and so without that, um, that an allocation or some reasonable allocation in uh, general security, um, that will um, certainly have a, have a significant impact on that base supply into, um, into temporary markets. Yep. Um, so just a, quick, um, just a quick chart just on, on permanent um, um, movements. And uh, certainly we've seen, uh, as Will showed before, some significant uplift in permanent um, pricing over the last uh, 48 months or so. Um, we're now starting to see a, um, a, just a softening slightly of, of those, um, those prices. So um, uh, you know, potentially um, prices coming back in different valleys, the Goulburn system, um, and particularly in line with, with some of the changes in the dairy industry, um, we're seeing s s quite significant uh, um, uh, price reduction uh, in, in Goulburn prices off a peak and a record peak, in fact, in, uh, in uh, December, January this year. So I'll hand it back to Tiki. Thank you.